everyone. Uh, we are ready to worship together today, but it's a little bit different of a Sunday. Uh, I am Christine Ginter, not Richard Jones. Uh, our pastor Richard is celebrating his 40th wedding anniversary and he and his wife are traveling through Europe right now. They're spending time in Paris and Rome. Uh, and they really, uh, I saw a few pictures, they're really taking in all the sights. The Eiffel Tower and the Louvre and having lots and lots of delicious food. So we can't wait for them to come back, but we're excited they get this time to spend together, these special moments. Uh, but we'll hold down the fort while they're gone. Uh, not too much is different about the service order today. I want to remind you all, especially if you're new, in your pews are a connect card. Um, they look like this. You can fill it out if you'd like. And also, if you'd like to be filled in on what's happening at St. James and you're not already on the email list, uh, you can add your email here, put it in the offering plate, and we'll add you to the list. But since Richard's gone, it might be a couple weeks before you get uh, some emails. Uh, we also have online giving cards as an act of worship throughout our offering. Um, if you do give online, you're welcome to put those in the plate to show and be a part of the service time as well. Uh, we do have single serve communion cups in the back. Uh, at St. James, our table it is God's table. Everyone is welcome. But if you don't feel comfortable in a big crowd right now, uh, you're welcome to take one from the back uh, and partake in communion with us, just not as close to us. Uh, we want to respect your comfort level too, so please feel free to do those. Those are also allergen friendly. If you happen to need gluten free, you can feel safe using one of those. And as we continue on in our service, um, you'll see white text and yellow text. Uh, the leader will read the white and you as a congregation can read the yellow text. We'll all participate together. Uh, but it is time to move on with worship and Suzanne Eanes, our new and fabulous piano player, uh, has a prelude for us to help us center and be ready to worship. Again, I will read the white text and you all read the yellow. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter the gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. 
For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Uh, we'll continue singing Blessed Assurance. The words will be on the screen, but if you'd like to follow along, it will be in your hymnal number 369. suggestion about how to pass the peace? Yeah. How, Hildy? Oh, a peace sign! Okay! Passing the peace is not just a way to greet each other, but to offer a blessing to those around us. So, it's really simple. You can just give each other the peace sign. You can say, the peace of God be with you and also with you. But since it's a peace sign, you can flash it to everybody, right? Okay, well, spend a few moments passing the peace, then we'll get back together for a few discussion questions. There's two today. So what does Jesus is mine mean?
if you're ready for the second question, it also is sent lyrics from the song. Uh, this is my story. So if you're comfortable, share a part of your faith journey or your faith story, uh, maybe where your faith journey started or an important influence you had in your faith journey or even maybe what you're hoping to discover next about God or in your own faith. So talk for a minute about your faith journey. i uh -huh. 
Morning from Jonah, chapter 1, very beginning, 1 through 17. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But, that great, uh, but Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. From the pres uh, so he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. The, then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. 
Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. Then, he said to, then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it, have done as pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks. Uh, one of the things I always loved to work about with Christine was the energy that she brought to everything she did. And uh, so I thank you for that energy and thanks for that great rendition of Jonah. I appreciate that very, very much. Jonah was in a line of great prophets. And he had one thing in common with a lot of the prophets. And that is... He didn't want to be a prophet. <laughs> I mean, not really. God called him to be a prophet. And the same way that God called Moses to be a prophet. And what did Moses say to God? I can't do that. I stutter. I'm a stutter. I, I, can't, I can't do this for you. Pick somebody else. And Elijah. Pick Elijah. Uh, and Elijah said, well, I, I can't do this. I'm... I'm too young. I'm just a kid. Pick somebody old. It seems that throughout the Old Testament, the prophets were always reluctant to be prophetic. And you can't blame them. Uh, the prophet's life was hard. Uh, but it reminded me that all of us, in our own ways, get to be prophets. You never know when something you say, you do, the way you show somebody or love somebody or care about somebody is going to be a prophetic moment in their life and in yours. Because almost every one of those prophets I mentioned ended up doing what the Lord asked them to do. So let's turn back to Jonah, this reluctant prophet, in the same way that we're a reluctant prophet. Sometimes we're just afraid. We're afraid to step out. We're afraid to extend that hand. We're, we're afraid to do something new and, and different. And I guess you could say that was Jonah. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Jonah was a Hebrew. He was in, living in Israel. And over here was Babylon. Okay? And over here was Syria. Okay? And back that way was Egypt. And they were all enemies. 
all those nations would sweep through Israel and plunder, murder, demand ransoms, destroy. And Jonah hated them all. But he especially hated the Babylonians. So when God calls Jonah and tells him to go to Nineveh, which is uh, kind of in modern day Iraq, and tells him to go to Nineveh, Jonah does what most reluctant prophets do. And I'll explain this. Um, okay, so, so here's where Jonah lives, this little patch right here called Israel. Okay. And back there is Babylon. Alright. And so Jonah, being the great man of God he is, instead of going to Nineveh, he goes. Oh, by the way, you're the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> so hold your breath if you can't swim. He goes all the way to Tarshish which is in Spain. Spain! He runs away as fast as he can. He grabs a boat in Joppa and he floats away. Well, that's where we heard our scripture jump in today. Uh, and you heard the story and you've heard it before. God appoints a wind, a mighty wind. So mighty that even the sailors are afraid. And then they, they cast lots. They, they gamble to see, well, whose fault is this? It's got to be somebody's fault. We don't usually have these kinds of storms. You're the Mediterranean Sea. You understand how it is. <laughs> and finally they decide against Jonah. And they try their best to save him. They don't know Jonah from, from Adam. They ask, who are you? Where are you from? Where are you going? Why are you here? And then they try their best to save him. But of course, ultimately Jonah has to say, I don't want to be the death of these men. Throw me overboard. Which they do. And immediately the storm ceases. Kind of reminds me of that story when Jesus is with the disciples and they're out on the Sea of Galilee and this big storm comes rolling in and Jesus is so cool, he's asleep. And the disciples are frantic. And finally they have to wake him up and say, we're going to die. And he calms the waters. And so it is that God calms the waters and then, as King James says, God appoints a fish, a big fish, uh, kind of like the Jaws music. <laughs> Such Jonah right now. Now there's a reason for this. There's twofold reasons for this, as a matter of fact. The first one is Jonah is an important book to us as Christians because he spends three days in the whale the big fish. What does that remind us of? Jesus' resurrection. Exactly. This becomes an analogy for Jesus' death and resurrection. And in that is our hope. That's why we can be prophets. Because we've heard the word of the Lord. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we're appointed. We're Lured. We're, we're sometimes pushed into being prophets in this day and age. And of course, the second reason is God usually gets what God wants. And God wanted Jonah in Nineveh, not Tarshish. And so, as you would know, the whale spits Jonah out. Even the whale can't stomach Jonah. Spits him out, and guess where he went, ends up? Nineveh. On the outskirts of Nineveh. Now this is where the story kind of takes a funny turn. Because Jonah decides he's going to do what God asks him to do. And what that is, is 
to tell the people of Nineveh to repent and to believe in God. Pretty simple message. What Jonah knows is what Jonah does, but he does it in his own way, which is halfway. But Nineveh is a great city, we're told. It's three days to walk across it. Three days. That's a pretty big city. And Jonah walks one day. Right? He, doesn't, he doesn't go downtown. He doesn't go to Fourth Avenue. All right? He doesn't get he doesn't get past Oro Valley. All right? And we all know there's no sin in the suburbs. Right? <laughs> if he wanted to really make a difference, he should go downtown. But he's in Oro Valley. And he says, one time, repent, believe in God, or die. And then he goes and he sits on a hill and he folds his arms and he says, okay, God, I did what you wanted me to do. Now you kill him. I hate him. I've always hated him. I've hated him for years. And I did it. But now it's your turn. But you know what happens sometimes when even reluctant prophets share the word of God? Yeah, miracles happen. The people of Nineveh, they hear that. And they take it to heart. And, and they begin to, to understand this loving, kind, gracious God. And the king even says, repent and believe. And so they put on sackcloth and ashes, which is a way to show their repentance. And the whole great city, all three days worth, repent and are saved. Now, I wish I could stop there. Because that's a word of grace for all of us. Never too late. It's never too late for us to accept, and it's never too late for us to believe, and it's never too late for us to share that grace with others. The poor old Jonah, he just can't get over his anger, his bitterness, his bigotry. And so he does what most mature men do. He pouts. Yes, he does. He goes and he pouts. He sticks his bottom with belt. Crosses his arm, sits under a tree, and says, you, you were supposed to kill him. I thought that was the deal. And God says to Jonah, you like that tree? You like that shade? Well, when that goes and it went, you're going to miss it. And I love the people of Nineveh more than you love that tree. I love the people of Nineveh as much as I love you. And I love the people of Nineveh enough to spare them. Let us pray. Gracious God, in our reluctance to be your people, guide us, lead us on, give us the grace and the strength we need to be prophets, however reluctant. Thank you for that grace and love which fills our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Would you please join us as we sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Could I ask those who will be helping to serve to come forward at this point? Those who are helping to serve our communion today. And again, we thank them as well. It's a special time, a special moment for all of us. On the night that he gave himself up for us, our Lord took bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. And after supper, he took a cup, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples and said, drink this, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves, our soul, our body, as a living sacrifice in union with Christ's ultimate sacrifice for us. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ given for you. Do this in remembrance of him. This is 
<laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but thank you for remembering because I did forget. I'm so sorry. And I was even reminded. Okay. These are the gifts of God. Thanks be to God. You may come forward now for Holy Communion or if you choose to have it in the pew.
this uh, a word of thanks to all of you. It's, it always feels like coming home when I preach here, so it's always nice to be here. And thank you very much. And just one more thing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community and communion of God's Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and evermore. Go in peace and take peace with you. Amen.